be really dead. That must be glorious. In the middle 19th century, fashionable Victorian townsfolk were becoming bored with the monotonous classical style they saw around them. The Victorian age was one of solid tradition, but also of forward thinking, and Great Britain saw itself as the main power broker on the world stage. And so, a new style needed to be found, but one based firmly in strength and solid convention. style began in the 12th century. The name itself is very telling and is based on the Goths who came from Sweden in around 150 AD. They had gained a reputation as a master race, being excellent warriors and spreading far and wide. An example of this is found in the Spanish word for royalty, Gotos, which is derived from Goth. They also brought with them a peculiar Gothic Christianity which seeped into the underculture of the masses and mixed dark pagan gods with Christian saints. By the Victorian age, the Gothic world was a distant and yet powerful past with dark imagery of the night and the dream world. The change became known as the Gothic Revival and was aided by such writers as Sir Walter Scott and Lord Tennyson, who wrote gripping moralistic tales that spoke of an age when chivalry and power rested with the ruling and righteous elite. It was fantastic propaganda for the state, and backed the revival of the medieval style, whilst all the time retelling pagan stories in a new light. Along with this style came a reawakening in the literary guilds and art societies. Not only had the Gothic revival changed the landscape, it also pointed those men and women who had time to think towards questions about the present contemporary world. Things were changing around them. The empire was growing, but it was also vulnerable. In the physical world, war was always just around the corner and battles forever being fought in one part of the empire or another. But in the spiritual world, the emotional mind of the people, another battle was being fought. With every success abroad came a new threat, namely the influence of the newfound cultures upon the strict Christian West. Misunderstood and misinterpreted, these new influences often took on a dark or sinister role in the mindset of the ordinary people, and many writers utilised this element in their work. Such great authors as Sir Arthur Conan Doyle used these perceived threats within their works, and very often misinformed but nevertheless, they revealed a racist bigotry that would not be tolerated today. From the Christian perspective, there was indeed a darker element underpinning the invasive influence from abroad. Some even took up the cause of these invaders and aided them by translating revered texts and claiming some ancient and sacred truth lay at the heart, awaiting discovery. A battle ensued in the public domain between newly formed societies on the one side such as the Theosophists and the established science on the other, which was still very much owned by the church and state. These influences from cultures such as the Hindu and Muslim world spread across the West, with followers and adherents being classified as occultists and demonised by the church. But the battle was not always in the open. 
Often artists and writers would hide their own beliefs under allegory and metaphor, as if to avoid the demonizing church and the loss of sales. The true skill was in being able to successfully craft the esoteric secrets into a particular work, whilst still attracting a buying public. In the years that followed, analysts studied the work of the greatest writers and discovered that there were indeed messages being subtly passed on. Victor Hugo, Alexandre Dumas, Edgar Allan Poe, Jules Verne and many more are now believed to have hidden occult knowledge within their work. The literary groups were overrun with Freemasonry and Rosicrucian tendencies, who themselves taught ancient wisdom as passed down from non-Christian sources. And yet on the surface the West was staunchly Christian, which most observers have agreed was a perfect device for controlling the growing masses. But Freemasonry under Victoria's reign flourished to the point that it would have been embarrassing if one were not a member. By 1840, there were over a hundred lodges in London and 340 in the provinces. Weekly Freemasonic newspapers were openly sold in newsagents and the royalty actively promoted its causes, but only to those of the ruling elite and social upper classes. On the one hand, the rulers needed to maintain strong control and discipline, and the church gave this element in a mostly non-violent manner. But on the other hand, these same religious leaders, writers, artists, industrial giants, politicians, and a whole host of others, were intrigued and beguiled by the world of mystery that was opening up before them. Battle lines for the mind were being drawn, and nobody had a map. A war was about to break out, and precious few could decide which side they were on. It was in this world that Bram Stoker emerged, and it was of this world that Dracula was finally formulated. Stoker was born in 1847 in Dublin, Ireland, to Abraham Stoker and Charlotte Thornley. He was one of seven children and was baptised at St John the Baptist Church where he regularly went. He was bedridden with a mysterious illness, making a complete and unexplained recovery at the age of seven. But this gave him time to think. I was naturally thoughtful, and the leisure of long illness gave opportunity for many thoughts, which were fruitful according to their kind in later years. His mother told him tales of fairies and folklore, and must have mentioned the she, a kind of fairy vampire. Did these early tales sink deeply into the mind of this young boy? His recovery was swift, however, and by the time he reached Trinity College in Dublin, he was actually excelling at physical activity, being named University Athlete, 
Along with this came a keen interest in history and philosophy, joining the College Historical Society as auditor and becoming president of the University Philosophical Society. Indeed, his very first paper reveals a distinct understanding of what is required of the writer and was entitled Sensationalism in Fiction and Society. By the late 1870s he was working as a civil servant in Dublin Castle and had written several theatre reviews, short stories and published a non-fiction work with the not very sensational title of The Duties of Clerks of Petty Sessions in Ireland. But things were about to change and following a rave review by Stoker of Hamlet, the infamous actor and star of the show, Henry Irving, invited him to become his manager at the Lyceum Theatre in London. The civil servant jumped at the chance, and in the meantime, in 1878, married Florence Balcom, who had previously been the suitor of Oscar Wilde. Bram Stoker was to spend the rest of his life in the epicentre of the new Victorian world, London, and with the influence of Henry Irving, he enjoyed the high society. In 1879, Florence and Bram Stoker had an only son whom they christened Irving Noel Thornley Stoker, in honour of their new found friend. The new influences on Stoker must have been profound. One of these influences was Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, whose home Stoker called a fairy pleasure house. Indeed, their mutual interest in the occult fairies, plays and of course, Henry Irving, had drawn them together. There was another element that may have drawn these various characters together. Almost all of the associations of Bram Stoker, including his own brother, were Freemasons. Like the Gothic world, Freemasons claim not to be a religion, and yet they hold dear to the Grand Architect in the same way that the Goths had held to their pagans, Gort or God. They were an influence of the esoteric, for the occult, and we find that many of the writers and artists, cult leaders and theosophists were members of the Freemasons. It was a hub of thought, intellectual discussion, brotherly assistance and above all, it offered a sense of belonging. And yet the records show no mention of Bram Stoker as a Freemason. There was a lot of speculation both during Stoker's lifetime and following that he was initiated in Dublin, but the Grand Lodge of Ireland has no record of the event. It is also rumoured that he was a member of the occult group, the Golden Dawn, and even the Rosicrucians, both groups linked with Freemasonry. A fleeting glimmer of his understanding of Freemasonry is said to be found in Dracula, and indeed many have stated that it is a Freemasonic work. In his book, The Lair of the White Worm, we find the phrase, We too are, I take it, tiled which is a Freemasonic phrase. Whatever the case, whether Stoker was a Freemason or not, 
The truth is that he was a man living in a world of infamous men who were almost all Freemasons. The influences upon him must have been substantial and the pressure to join with his fraternal brothers immense. In fact, his own master, his employer, a man whom Stoker admired till the day he died, was a Freemason. Bram Stoker died in 1912 and his ashes placed in Golders Green Crematorium. In 1914, his book, Dracula's Guest, was posthumously published by his widow. Today, Bram Stoker is remembered as the father of Dracula, and dozens of film adaptations, books, and even computer games speak of his legacy. But did he cleverly encode a secret message into this timeless work of fiction? or simple. Bram Stoker was a clever, thoughtful man with a degree in mathematics and even being invited to the bar as a lawyer. He worked under a Freemason actor and had Freemason friends. He researched tirelessly the myths and folklore of the world and he lived in a time of Gothic and esoteric revival. Did Bram Stoker plant elements from all these influences into his works that still hold a message for us today? Regardless of modern popular perceptions, Bram Stoker did not invent the vampire, nor did he create Dracula. Both these and other elements within his famous novel had appeared before, but he did link them together. In his research, Stoker read such works as Transylvania Superstitions by Emily Gerard and met with Arminius Vambury, the Balkan expert. He was influenced by Sheridan Le Fanu's Carmilla, an erotic tale about lesbian vampires, and John Polidori's The Vampire, with a character based upon the mad, bad Lord Byron. What Stoker did was to fuse these stories together into a coherent and exciting tale that struck a chord with the masses. He finally had some use for the knowledge he had gained when he wrote his first university paper, Sensationalism in Fiction and Society. begins with the English solicitor, Jonathan Harker, visiting Count Dracula's castle in the Carpathian Mountains on the border of Transylvania and Moldavia. The purpose of the mission is to provide legal aid for Dracula to buy real estate in England and thus bring his vampirism to Great Britain and the home of the teeming millions. But 
Parker quickly discovers that something is not quite right and that he is in fact prisoner of this strangely nocturnal count. Then one night he falls under the spell of the Three Brides of Dracula and is only saved at the last minute by the Count himself, who needs Harker alive for his legal transactions. Eventually, Harker manages to escape from the castle and flees back to England. We next find that the Russian ship Demeter has run aground at Whitby, with all the crew missing except the captain, who is found dead at the wheel. Dracula, in the form of a large dog, is said to have leaped ashore and pretty soon is menacing Harker's fiancée, Mina Murray, and her friend Lucy Westenra. We are then introduced to three gentlemen, Arthur Holmwood, Quincy Morris, and Dr. John Seward, all of whom propose marriage to Lucy. Soon, Lucy begins to waste away and her suitors begin to worry. Dr. Seward calls on his old friend Abraham Van Helsing, who tries in vain to revive Lucy with blood transfusions. The Westenra household is then attacked by a terrifying wolf, and Lucy succumbs to death. Van Helsing, a most distinguished scientist whose name we know, even in the wilds of Transylvania. She is buried soon afterwards, but quickly, reports of a beautiful lady stalking children at night emerge, and Van Helsing realizes that Lucy has become a vampire. The three suitors and Van Helsing track her down and stake her heart, finishing her off with a beheading. Now, Jonathan Harker and Mina join forces with the team and track Dracula down. But the Count manages to get to Mina and bites her three times, feeding on her blood and creating a kind of spiritual bond between them. Mina's mind wanders between the living world and that of the undead as the blood of the vampire surges through her veins. It seems the only way to overcome this cruel torment is to kill Dracula himself who flees back to Transylvania. The group follow in hot pursuit and before sunset catch him, shear his throat and stab him with a bowie knife. He slowly crumbles to dust before their eyes, and Mina is freed from the spell. This, in short, is the tale of Dracula. The question is, are there any clues to the real message that we can uncover? The first and most obvious place to begin is with the main character himself, Dracula.
Not surprisingly, there has been a lot of debate over the origins of Bram Stoker's Dracula. One bone of contention is the origin in the infamous Vlad the Impaler. Vlad III, Dracula of Valachia, is a conventional 15th century figure. In Romania, he is often heralded as a hero and elsewhere as a demon of the highest order. It is said he impaled his victims in their thousands, but also that he was a good ruler. Whatever the case, his title, Dracula, is derived from his father's title of Dracul, with Dracula being the son of Dracul. Although the title took on the meaning of demon, in fact it means dragon, being derived from the Latin draco. And this shall become important, not least because the dragon was the winged serpent. The title, in fact, comes from Vlad II's membership of the Order of the Dragon, begun in the early 15th century by the King of Hungary and Holy Roman Emperor Sigismund. It is in fact originated in the Order of St. George from the 14th century an inference to the dragon slaying and hence pagan slaying abilities of Christianity. Its main aim was to protect the West against the Ottoman Turks, even though at the time various people described it as a pagan rite. The argument amongst fans of Dracula and Stoker is quite simple. One camp believes that Vlad III was the original Dracula and that Stoker used him in particular. The other camp states that there is no evidence for this. So, let's take a look. In the book, Dracula, Bram Stoker points out the very old European tradition that bad things occur on St. George's Day unless one has spiritual protection. This tradition goes right back to pagan times when this dragon slaying implied the death and destruction of the old ways by the empire-building Catholic Church. This itself links nicely with the Order of the Dragon of St. George, of which Vlad was a member. In addition to this, we know that Bram Stoker befriended Araminus Vambri, the Balkans expert, and read Gerard's Transylvania superstitions. Originally, Stoker was to call his character Count Vampire, but following his reading of Romanian folklore and history, he changed his mind. Dracula was from Zichelis, who are a distinct people from Central and Eastern Europe. They still hold to the symbol of the sun and moon, of their ancient gods, and this symbol reveals that element of being between two worlds, night and day. then that the name itself must have derived from these Transylvanian histories. This does not mean, however, that the traits of Dracula were copied from Vlad the Impaler. In fact, the traits of Dracula lie elsewhere and are not the result of one character in particular. It shall become obvious as we uncover more of the subtle codes just what Dracula is supposed to represent. For instance, there is a clue in the very method used to deliver Count Dracula to the shores of England.
you have sent me away And what can I do when I do what I do You seem to haunt me all day Now where can I find what I found when I first met you You were unkind but I simply can't forget you The ship, the Demeter, a Russian vessel, is used and all aboard die mysteriously. The first obvious point here is that Demeter is the Greek goddess and nourisher of youth. It is she who preserves the life and death cycle, being the giver and the taker. Here in Stoker's book, she is the bringer of Dracula, the taker of life. The implication is simple that Stoker is telling us some sacred truth is to be revealed, for Demeter is the protector of the sacred. All those profane aboard have died, and this mothership has given birth to the Dark Lord. The ship is also Russian, and there were plenty of reasons for Russia to be implicated as the deliverer of this invasion force. But we are told that this is a sacred ship, a mother goddess bringing some new message. There was a motherly figure who was extremely famous in Stoker's day, and who influenced his writings, whether directly or indirectly. Great arguments surrounded this woman of infamy, for her outspoken ways and her leadership of the occult theosophy. Her name was Madame Blavatsky, and she was Russian. It was Blavatsky who would influence not just Stoker, but hundreds of other artists, writers, and all manner of people. Conan Doyle was one of these, and of course, he was also a good friend of Bram Stoker. What she offered was entry into the world unseen. She hinted at arcane and esoteric secrets hidden within the teachings of the East, and in fact, it was an Eastern Star Freemason. Her world was the other world, and Dracula is quite blatantly of this other world, for he cannot cast a shadow nor be seen in a mirror. My humble apology. I dislike mirrors. Simply put, Blavatsky and her Theosophical Society were blamed by a great many people in the Christian West for undermining these traditions, lifestyles and power base. In fact, her rapid rise to fame and the growth of similar societies was a big worry indeed. Annie Besant, 
another prominent theosophist and feminist, along with Blavatsky, were blamed for the loss of India to the British Empire in later years, due to the constant undermining of the traditional stance for supposedly humane reasons. But how does this help in our understanding of what message Bram Stoker is telling us? Well, we know that Stoker chose the name Dracula, and that he must have learned this from his studies on Romania and Vlad. We also know that the name Dracula means the son of the dragon, and was a title given to members of the Order of the Dragon. How does this relate to the Theosophists and the world of the occult? Well, we also learned earlier that the dragon was in fact the winged serpent, and the serpent had been worshipped across the world for millennia, long before Christianity stamped its authority over the serpent worshippers. The image of Archangel Michael and St. George killing the dragon, not to mention Mary crushing the serpent underfoot, and a great many more, are images of the Christian church overcoming the power of the pagan serpent worshippers. The Druids were known as Adders, and almost every culture from Egypt to India held the serpent sacred. The question is, why and what does this have to do with Dracula? The Eastern traditions highlighted by Blavatsky and many others all revolve around the serpent. A creature by this time had become demonic due to the Christian church's attitude. This serpent was, to many, seen as a spiritual force within the human being, a kind of energy that needed tapping in order to self-realize and meet God. Of course, this was utter blasphemy in the Christian West, and the onslaught of these ideas upon the fabric of Victorian England was seen as an invasion of the darkest nature. In addition to this, the ritualistic practices of those following the newly reformed serpent spirituality embarked upon misinterpreted elements of a sexual nature, making divine union and the often crude symbols and carvings of the East as literal instructions. This could easily be the reason for Dracula's overt sexual serpentine energy spoken of by Bram Stoker. Dracula is the human form of this otherworldly serpent dragon beast, delivered to these shores by Demeter, the mother goddess from Russia. His intent was to come to the land of the teeming millions and to thereby repopulate the globe with the living dead. He is the symbol of the new wave of Eastern spirituality, sexual perversions and dark occult practices that so frightened the stuffy traditionalists of Christian Victorian England. Almost everybody misinterpreted everybody else because of religion and belief. The Christians were set and safe in their trinity. The New Age mystics adamant and yet fresh to millennia-old cultures and in-between linguists struggled with interpreting complex words and changed the entire meaning. Spiritual rebirth very quickly became Gothic death. In truth, it was the concept of the Eastern Maya which was misunderstood in the West as death, where in fact it is the concept of illusion which we must see through in order to realize the true state of existence. It is the true death that must be obtained, not the literal death. And this is why Dracula, the embodiment of the serpent deity, says, to die, to be really dead, that would be glorious. In the Eastern belief, he is searching for escape from the material world, and it is a sacred journey requiring sacred blood offerings. 
This same esoteric notion is spoken and ritualized in many occult groups and societies, not least of which is Freemasonry. Here, the initiate must die to his old self in order to be reborn within the new family. It is the ritual of control and quite often blood itself must be drawn as a sacrifice, offering and a sign of blood brotherhood. Indeed, the blood ritual has been part and parcel of human tradition and religion for as long as the vampire itself. Other clever devices utilized by Stoker and Dracula. For instance, Abraham van Helsing is the character who is brought in to save the West from this evil Eastern concept. In a sense, Stoker is here offering himself up as the sacrifice in a paradoxical esoteric manner, for his own name is Abraham, and Helsing is derived from the word howls, meaning neck or throat. This is therefore the sacred offering of Abraham, through which God will bless the whole family or state. But there is something much more enlightening about Van Helsing when we look into one of the main influences of this character, the German professor Max Muller. Although Van Helsing is supposed to be Austrian in the book, he is in fact speaks German and the original manuscript has him as such. Max Muller was German and a contemporary specialist in religion and mythology. These are the required sciences to battle the likes of the theosophists, not medicine and mathematics, and Max Muller did, in real life, take on Blavatsky herself. Indeed, Stoker himself wrote that Helsing was to be a German professor of history, named Max Winderschuffel, but these changed to Austrian professor and then Helsing in order to distance the character from his real-life counterpart. It was Max Muller who first used the word theosophy, later stolen by his arch-rivals, the theosophists. He said that Blavatsky had done much mischief in her lack of understanding the Hindu religion and argued against her so-called secret doctrine. Bram Stoker knew Max Muller under Blavatsky and her ilk and he was aware of the famous battle of words that constantly surfaced in the press. It was claimed at the time that Stoker himself was a member of some magical society akin to the Theosophists or the Golden Dawn, but there is no evidence of this. Instead, it appears that Stoker is in fact highlighting a very real fear amongst the Western Christian world, that these new cults would and were taking positions of power and invading the lands and the minds of the people. Indeed, Stoker even used code to point this out with Dracula's first victim being Lucy Westenra, 
Westenra is, of course, the West, as opposed to the mythical East, and the name Lucy derives from light itself. Dracula has therefore turned out the light of the West. In another name we have yet more code. John Seward is the man who calls upon Van Helsing and his name reveals his true conduct. John is a name of solidity, a true old-fashioned name of one who can be trusted and meaning God is merciful. Seward again is strong and means guardian of the sea. John Seward is the strong British man guarding the shores against invasion. Another element practiced widely by the occultists was trance-inducing hypnotism, and we not surprisingly discover that Dracula is capable of this mysterious art, controlling the mind of the weak. But science too was developing hypnotism, and it was becoming popular in Stoker's time. It is therefore fitting that Van Helsing also has the power of hypnotism, but not by any mysterious other world method, but by pure scientific reasoning. The science of the West is here overcoming the mythical occult world of the East. In other works by Stoker, there are similar battles between the good Christian West and the evil serpent. In the lair of the white worm, we have the Lady Arabella, meaning prayerful, battling the serpent here, called the worm, which in fact means serpent. In the same book, Bram Stoker makes the point about the madness that inflicts those who stray into the world of this ancient serpent. Edgar Caswell is afflicted by the torment of madness, which is here depicted as egotism. Come to me. You shall see now what you are despising, what you are warring against. All that you see is mine. The darkness as well as the light. But a time before Varys, the tale of a king and a queen. These are the words of the Gnostic god of the abyss, the lord of light and dark, the one who has power of the dual nature of the mind. At the very touch of his hand, Stoker claims the power mounts up and up. It is the serpent energy, the sexual energy spoken of by the occultists for generations and demonized by the church. This serpent is the coiled one of the Hinduism that must rise and fall like a wave. And Stoker makes this very point saying that this serpent is coiled, it rises and falls, and that no one can see it, for it lies within each of us. It is the serpent from the Garden of Eden, although Stoker calls it the Garden of Evil, and our hero is none other than Adam. This first or prime man meets Lila, who is really Lilith, 
the name Lilith, whom Jewish myth states was wed with Adam. Lilith is the serpent deity herself, and she tempts. But Adam overcomes and marries Mimi, which is another form of Mary, the mother of God. The snake is seemingly of paramount importance as the adversary for Bram Stoker in the lair of the white worm, snakes, pass and Dracula. The symbolic references abound. In Dracula, Harker's carriage is sent out on a serpentine way in a manner like the serpent and even the peasant's cart has a long snake-like vertebra. Bram Stoker was indeed pointing towards a serpentine mythological past and warning of the consequences that would befall the Christian West should the battle be lost. He implicated modern occultists and created a fictional battle of light against darkness. It is a tale as old as man, for the true light and dark resides within us and must be balanced and controlled in the same vein that Stoker points out. Stoker's tales are not initiatory stories like those of Jules Verne. They are instead warnings against losing battles and succumbing to the dark forces that rage within each of us and within society in general. The seemingly solid traditional Christian values of Victorian England were under threat. Not from some invading army, but from within the spiritual dimension. They will come in the night, for they reside within. They have no shadow, for they are the shadow self. Their reflection cannot be seen, for they do not reflect the light. Like black holes, they suck the very lifeblood from society. They are the serpent ones who must be crushed, impaled, beheaded. The serpent is a powerful force not to be toyed with. This is the message of Bram Stoker. His employer, Sir Henry Irving, a Freemason and moralist, was seen as an actor trying to revive a Gothic style in his productions. He produced plays which consistently fostered the sense of good and evil, right and wrong, and his lead characters would do battle with personal demons in order to achieve a higher level of consciousness. In a distinctly esoteric statement, he would often play both the role of the hero and adversary, revealing that we are all both sides of this same coin. Irving revived the supernatural medieval focus in the theatre, revealed the ancient battle within the mind of man himself, and his young employee would follow suit in print. Could Stoker have been Irving's young Freemasonic apprentice? We shall never know. May I call later and inquire how you are feeling? I hope you haven't taken my stories too seriously. The whole tale of Dracula is quite circular. In reality, Bram Stoker was telling us the age-old story of the battle between the pagan East and the Christian West, between the controlling powers and the spiritual world. There is little difference between the world of Dracula invading the West and Order of the Dragon continuing the worship of the serpent dragon beneath the very noses of the church. The Catholic Church believed many centuries ago that they had stamped out the last of the serpent worshippers and heralded their superheroes in St. George, St. Michael, St. Paul and St. Patrick, their serpent-crushing warriors for Christ. Bram Stoker revealed to us that the battle was still afoot only a hundred years ago 
and that the ancient concept of trans-induced states attributed often to the serpent's sexual energy was still very much alive. This time, he warned, the dark influence was coming in legally, as Harker the hero of Dracula is employed by the Count to make his invasion legal. Was it a warning or just a simple statement? Whose side was Bram Stoker on? Was he simply observing a cultural shift or, or was he trying to affect it? Whatever his wishes, he had created a cult following for the Dark Lord of Transylvania like never before and raised up the stakes in the game of the soul. there is a moral message that speaks today as loudly as it has ever done. In all these elements laid out before us, the most important of all is the act of our own will. The occultists tell us that the alchemical unions of which they speak are only empowered by the will of the adherent. The sexual serpent energy is nothing without the willpower or the one practicing the rituals. God is nothing, we are told, without the will from the individual. In the same way that Dracula cannot enter into our home unless we will it, Stoker tells us that quite plainly that whatever we choose shall become our own reality. The choice in Dracula is one of the dark Gothic old ways, losing our sense of self, our life blood, and succumbing to its mystical charm or maintaining the traditional values of the Christian West and following the path of rationalism and science. The choice is as relevant today as it has always been. As the man they called the Antichrist, the occultist Alistair Crowley was to say in the lifetime of Bram Stoker, Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law.